<clears throat> all right class hopefully you can see it don't look too bad power still off in the house so i can't turn the lights on this is the inside panel uh 100 amp it's actually a main breaker panel as you can see it does have a main breaker up here 100 amp main it could have just as easily been a main lug so <clears throat> what have we done at this point well i remember i told you this is now a sub panel it once was the main panel when it was the main panel this grounding bar was not in here. I have added that, okay? Um, and this is the neutral bus, and this is the neutral bus here. And as you notice, they're connected by this bar on the bottom. Um, <clears throat> and before I did any work in here, all of both the white wires, which are the neutral or grounded conductors in the circuit, and the bare, equipment grounds were all attached to the same bus. The reason that they were is because um, this was the main panel, it was the only panel, and in the main panel in a service, the neutrals and equipment grounds go to the same bus. That's the only place in an electrical system that they go to the same bus. Once you go to another panel, a sub panel, the ground must be grounded to the structure and the grounds must be separate and the neutrals must float, which means they are not grounded in this panel. If you'll notice, that neutral bus is on plastic. Nowhere is this touching metal, except right here, this number six ground wire, which probably is an old ground that went to the water line. I will remove that, okay? I've already removed this grounding strap. The grounding strap went here and it bonded this bus to the, to the metal uh, enclosure. You can see the hole above it there. I removed that. Once I removed this, which I should have already done, I, I just missed it, um, then this neutral bus will be isolated from ground. It'll be sitting on this plastic. Nowhere will it be connected to the metal. All of this is, this is mounted directly to the steel. Uh, I drilled two holes and tapped them with threads. So these are screws that are threaded into that steel enclosure so that this enclosure, this bar, and all these equipment grounds are at the same electrical potential. Uh, the neutrals are floating, as you can see, okay? I will remove this. So just wanted you to see what that looks like. What did I do? I, I pulled this number four copper grounding equipment grounding conductor um, into the panel and that's what that's what it looks like okay the grounds and the neutrals are separated and i'm going to go outside and show you what it looks like in the main panel so just bear with me let me go out the door here around the outside here to our main panel and you can see this is the wiring coming in or actually it's feeding into the panel this is the original wire the two hots and the, the neutral this is the ground wire that I added remember I told you that in the main panel the neutrals and the equipment grounds are at the same potential and connected to the same bus and as you can see the neutral will come in from the power company. I will run a new riser pipe down and that neutral will connect here. And obviously it's mounted directly to the steel. So it's the, the can and the neutral bus is at the same potential in this panel. It does not float. We come down here. This is our neutral going to our sub panel right here. This is the new ground and equipment ground that we pulled to our sub panel right here. They are attached to the same bus here in the panel. Now, something inspectors will sometimes do when he comes out to look at it. In this case, he may not because power will be on in here. And so he most likely will not do that. But sometimes when it's new construction, he will remove the neutral wire here then he will take his own meter and he will check from this wire to ground and make sure that this wire isn't grounded in there. 
which means if he if he reads uh makes a circuit between when this is removed and you check between this and this wire with an ohm meter if you have continuity that means inside there somewhere this wire is grounded okay we can't have that so um, sometimes they'll check it. In this case, he probably won't just simply because there will be power on in this box when he comes and he ain't likely to fool around with that. Um, it's just not safe for him and you know, it is done properly and he probably won't check it, but sometimes they do. So anyway, what'll happen now, I'm ready to turn the power back on if I want to. Uh, the weather seems to be holding. I'm gonna go ahead and see if I can get my new riser up the side of the house and wire it in. What will happen once that's done? Once that's done, as you can see, I've wired a temporary cable over here to the feed through lug. What'll happen is, is when I set that meter back in that base, the top lugs there are hot. When I set the meter back in, it will feed over here to these feed through lugs. As you can see, these are connected to the two bus bars in the panel. So when I set that meter, it'll energize these wires and it'll energize this bus bar. I will leave this main turned off. That way it will not allow it to feed up here. These things will back feed, so we have to be careful with that. You would never do this in normal wiring, but this is a temporary situation. We have to keep the power on in the structure, so we're allowed to get by with certain things temporarily while we're waiting for the inspector to come out and give his approval for the new wiring. So what we'll do is we'll feed the power in here, and this bus bar will be hot. And as you can see, this is where it's connected to the main. We will leave the main off. That way power does not get through to these lugs. None of this from here up, from here up will be hot. And then this breaker we will turn on and it will feed the panel inside so that everything in the structure will be on. We've got some new circuits we're gonna pull out here to this panel. We're gonna wire a new water heater. We're gonna wire uh, a range outlet and we're gonna wire a dryer outlet uh, out to here. So we have space for that in here. So when this is all said and done, those breakers will be in this panel as well. But once the, uh, once the inspector approves it, all this will be taken down. I'll plug that knockout hole right there. And uh, the power will then come down the new riser pipe and feed through and it'll be a normal system. So still gotta get the ground rods in, gotta get the riser up. So I just wanted you to see that and let you know what it looks like. Hey everybody, back for just a second. I want to show you the components of this uh, service mast that we're going to install here. Since this is not going through the roof, and since this service mast will not be carrying any weight, sometimes if you've noticed that the, the mast goes through the edge of the roof and it's a steel pipe and they attach the wire to it, that will not be the case here. Uh, we can get more than enough clearance without going through that roof, number one. Number two, the utility is already attached to the side of the house. So we're gonna put this riser in PVC like the old one, but we've gotta go with a two inch plastic uh, to accommodate our wire size. You size your conduit, your raceways, for the conductors that you're gonna place in them. And this is gonna have two four alts and one two alt aluminum conductors in it, which is a large conductor. Therefore, it requires a two inch raceway. So that's what we're doing. So it's just, I cut about a foot and a half or so of it off to make it the right height. But what do we do here? This has to obviously be weather tight. So I installed a hub. If you notice that metal thing uh, with the four bolts in it on the left, that's, that's a threaded hub. And that is a plastic male adapter that is screwed down into that hub so it will be weather tight. The PVC riser will glue into that male adapter. We'll attach it at a couple points on the um, side of the house to support it up there. And then on top of, it will be something called a weather head. Now this will be a plastic weather head since it's plastic pipe. If this were a steel you know, piece of rigid conduit, I'd use a metal weather head. Uh, and, and so this weather head, I can do this one handed here. It'll glue right on top of this pipe like this. And so this, this will pop off. See how that comes off so I can thread the wire through that. And um, then this snaps back on it to keep water from going down the pipe. So this is called a weather head and that's what keeps water from going down into your, um, down into your um, <laughs> meter base, excuse me. Lost my train of thought there. So the wires will come out here 
and it'll go down into the um, meter base and that'll keep the weather out. All right, I'll get this installed and bring you back. All right, class, we're back. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm gonna try to be quick because I ain't got much battery left. I've been just working along and um, it's, forgot to put it on charger. Anyway, we got our old meter base temporarily tied up. We have our new weather head in place, as you can see. New wire, new weather head that is not connected. The utility, the city of Morganton in this case, will do that. <clears throat> so power will come down that riser and into the top lugs of that meter. Once the city of Morganton changes this over after the inspector's approval, they will energize that and cut this down and leave it laying and I'll have to get rid of it. They'll move the meter from here to here. Then the main breaker will be turned on. <clears throat> it will energize the bus and everything from there. If you'll notice, I have my ground grounding electrode conductor is what this is called. It must be unbroken from its connection in the meter can all the way down to the first ground rod. If you use a second wire from this ground rod to the second ground rod, there's an exception in the code that will allow you to do that, okay? But it must be unbroken from here to here. This ground rod, obviously, has not been driven. That's what that handy dandy tool and a sledgehammer are for. <clears throat> now, if you're fortunate enough to have a big half inch rotary hammer, you can cap it over and drive it right down in the ground. I used to have one, but I don't have one anymore. I have one, but it's not large enough to cap over a ground rod, unfortunately. That said, <clears throat> I'll drive that ground rod. I don't have any clamps with me, I don't think. So I just tuck the ground wire up under the house so some, uh, you know, varmint don't run off with it. Um, it's attached to the house here. But I wanted to make a point there. It'll go from that ground rod to this ground rod and end up here. Here's an important point. Not everything you do, well, let me rephrase that. Everything you do as an electrician is governed by the National Electrical Code, okay? It is, <clears throat> but not everything that applies to the work you do is in the National Electrical Code. There are other codes and standards that from time to time you have to meet. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's, that's just how it is. There's fire code standards that you'll run into sometimes regarding smoke detectors and CO uh, and CO2 detectors or carbon monoxide detectors. Um, that's not in the National Electrical Code. It's in the National Fire Protection Code. Uh, which is overarching over even the electrical code. You as the electrician wind up having to do that. Here's another one. I'm gonna try and read what that white sticker says. Notice our ground wire, our grounding electrode conductor is gonna go from this ground rod up all the way through the panel, through here, and connecting this lug. Why? Because it says, for metering equipment group spec grounding, okay? Metering equipment group, uh, or MEG for short, is a group that a bunch of utilities belong to. <sighs> kind of showed up a few years ago, and I don't see a thing. Uh, okay, right there. Meter equipment group MEG approved, okay? That is not the National Electrical Code. That is a utility code, and these utilities uh, adopted this <clears throat> in order to become more uniform in the types of meter bases that are used on their systems. Back in the good old days, 35 and 40 years ago, and back when I did this, up until about 20 years or so ago, maybe a little longer, the, the, the power company actually would provide you with a meter base, and typically you had a separate meter base and a panel outside. Uh, that's very rare these days. Now everybody buys these combos, and there's a reason for that. It's a real labor saver, and you don't have to, I mean, it, it's they're great. So. I use them, not everybody else does, unless there's an exceptional case where you need to use a separate meter base and panel. That happens sometimes. But uh, the reality is the, the meter equipment group, the MEG, proved basically the National Electrical Code don't have anything to do with that. But I can tell you that if the city of Morganton inspector comes out here, and because the city of Morganton is the utility too, they work very closely with those guys. If it ain't MEG approved, he won't pass it, okay? And I, you know, have run into that on Duke's system. I just finished a new house up in Columbus. Well, I'm almost finished. 
up in Columbus, North Carolina. <clears throat> And the, the Duke engineer made a very specific point to tell me, make sure that you use a ringless type mega proof meter base or we won't connect to it. And that's kind of become the standard. So it's not just the NEC you got to adopt. But in other, anyway, what that thing says is for metering equipment group specification grounding shall be terminated and securely attached to the ground lug located in the utility section. No brake shall be allowed in the grounding wire. And that's the grounding, they're calling it the grounding wire. The proper name is the grounding electrode conductor. This section here, from here up, is the utility section. This thing here is also, but behind that's also considered utility. Um, if they were putting in an underground service, they would run it up through that. But this is overhead, so that's unused. But that's the utility section. Once this is approved and the meter set, they will seal this and they'll put a seal on it and you can't get in it anymore unless you break their seal. So that's the utility section and per meg spec, you have to terminate that grounding electrode conductor in the utility section under that lug. And if you don't, the city of Morgan inspector will turn down your job. Um, you have to, you, you know, there's more than just the NEC. You have to make sure that you meet. A lot to keep up with. I mean, you can do it. Don't, don't misunderstand me. It's just not a, you know, learn it once and move on kind of a job. You're going to learn this as long as you do it. I've been at it almost 40 years. And, um, I learn all the time, believe you me. I, I learn all the time. You know how I learned about that? Because it wasn't the standard at one time. I made the mistake of attaching it down here. And guess what I had to do? I had to change that wire out from here to here, okay? So just wanted to show you where that was and what's going on. I'm gonna drive this ground rod. If I have lugs or, or ground rod clamps, I'm gonna go ahead and hook the grounding electrode up. Um, if I don't, then I'll just have to do that when I come back again. But I'm going to get that driven down in the ground so somebody don't run off with it. I'm going to button this up and we'll get the power back on in this house. All right. Adios. All right, everybody. Real quick, here's your final product from the weather head down. Got it closed up, temporary it over. Power is on in the house. Everything's operating back to normal. We've got our ground electrode conductor installed. Drove the ground rod down into the ground, left just enough up that I can put a clamp on it to attach uh, the conductor to it, and then I'll drive it out of sight. Um, drove it in eight feet with that fence post driver, works great for that. And then an eight pound hammer to finish it up. And um, fortunately, it's pretty good, well, pretty good soil. I think they've filled this in at some point, so. It wasn't as hard as it could have been. It didn't hit any rocks, which is amazing, Burke County. Anyway, uh, that's the final product for now. Once it's inspected and all, like I said, the uh, city will hook it up and get the utilities switched over here. One more thing I do need to add that I don't have with me. I got one in my shop. I will add something onto this ground and electrode conductor called a bond bridge. It's a, it's a terminal that fits under that without breaking it and I'll attach it to the wall. And the purpose of that is so that other utilities, AKA cable TV and or the phone company or whoever can ground their equipment. See, they got a little small ground wire. That's the old ground wire that I'm cutting out. I'll hook it up for them back to the bond bridge. That's a code requirement that came out a few years ago. Uh, one of, one that I actually agree with. Some of them are just stupid and you know, centered around making somebody a dollar, I am quite convinced. But that one's a good one, actually. It forces everybody to hook their ground to the same point, which we'll discuss in class, the principle of capacitance and how that can be dangerous. And that can be set up in the case where you have more than one ground rod or more than one grounding point in a structure, unless you tie them together. Um, and that used to be the case. We'll try and discuss that in class, but anyway, that's what we got, and I'm going to pick up my junk and uh, probably call it a day. Adios.